Please pause the video and take a moment to read this important safety message. All right, on to part two. We're going to start the restoration on this unit. Part one, we kind of look at the history, a little bit of the provenance of this unit, talked about the controls on the front. But today we're actually going to dig in and, and get into this unit. And as you can see here, um, there's original Telefunken tubes in this use. I do see a Rayovac here. So, um, you know, potentially some of these tubes have been replaced in the uh, years because I think this unit was in use for many, many years. Um, the two metal six, I mean, EL34s that were in this unit, um, the owner decided that he, you know, he had another use for those. Um, so he didn't ship those with him. He wanted me to put in some new EL34s here. And he didn't ship the 5U4s either, but I've got plenty of those. And as you can see here on the back of this unit, you've kind of got your uh, power input here, a hum adjust. you got your speaker output. It's really easy to figure out here your uh, connections on the back. you got your 3-amp Slovo fuse. you got an accessory jack. We've got a DC balance, and this these little wings slot out. We'll, we'll talk about these more later and when we get to biasing this unit. Um, we've kind of got our playback out to recorder. We've got an, our TV input. I just thought this was craziness uh, that that existed back then. We've got our, uh, our tape or tuner. We've got our um, kind of our level here for that, and we've got our Mag one and mag two. Keep in mind, this is mono unit, so this is a uh, this is a uh, number two to recorder. This is playback. This is TV. This is to the recorder. This is tuner. This is tape. Mag one, mag two. So these are not stereo plugs the way they look. Got our uh, what appears to be output transformer right here. We've got our hefty um, power transformer here, and then looks like we've got one, two, three, four can caps here. We've got some 12AU and 12AX7s on this unit and a 6AV6 here, so um, that's kind of the tube complement. If we turn the unit on its side here, it's still got the nice little pictogram here that gives you the uh, the tube layout. And this, this unit is in amazing condition. Uh, Alright, first action I'm going to take is just really to pull all the tubes out. Put them in a Ziploc bag. And we can uh, we can test them while we're waiting on our parts um, because I've you know I've got enough tubes to replace these if any of these need replacing. You'd be surprised though how many times these old uh, dual triodes, even though they've been in play for a long time, are still in really great shape. So um, we'll see how that turns out on as we test them and. Uh, won't show you the long version of that, but we'll, uh, we'll do a short version of, of the, uh, the testing. At any rate, we're going to get this unit turned upside down and take a look inside of it. Okay, what I want to do first before I open the bottom up is I want to catalog these four can caps. And so um, I use a couple things for that, a magnifying glass, because even though I'm not 61 years old like these amps are, and I hope when I am 61 years old I look as good as these amps, um, I'm 50, and uh, I have a hard time seeing, so, uh, you know, I just kind of catalog, um, kind of cap one, 10 microfarad at 450 volts, then there's another 10 microfarad section, a 25 microfarad section at 25 volts, and then there's another 25 at 25 volts. Um, so I'll just go through and do that for each one of these caps and I'll probably just do a little diagram drawing over here on the side and I'll label them like cap 1, cap 2, cap 3, 4. Alright, so we'll get all those laid out here for you. But one other thing you got to pay attention to is kind of the height of these, uh, of these caps as you measure them. And these today, um, if I measure them off the, the base here, they're right at two inch caps on these uh, on these units. So, um, so the bottom line, it, sometimes the height of these is important. And the reason being is if you were to ever put a cover on this, if you, it's kind of hard to see here without me moving the camera, but you've only got about, you've got less than a quarter of an inch of play right in between here. Um, between the top of the 
cap and if, if you include the transformer there where the cover would go. So if you installed two and a half or three inch capacitors here um, tall, it would not work out. We're going to have to play within this two inch range as we order new replacements. Okay, and as you can see here, uh, 10, 10 at 450, 225 at 25, and 25 at 25. Notice the can is negative on this here. The cap 4 is exactly like cap 1. Cap 2 here, 30 at 475 and 20 at 475, and the can is negative. And cap 3 is just like cap number 2. So really I need two of these, two of these, and uh, put this unit back in order from an electrolytic standpoint. Okay, the bottom's held on. We're going to remove the four feet from it here. And uh, they're held on with just some uh, flat blade screwdriver screws that kind of go through the chassis and uh, and if you had a case this you know they, these would feed through the case kind of as well um, but then to get the actual bottom off there these these are the transformer mounts um, those unit those you screws you will not remove but going all the way around it here 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 You've got these quarter inch little, um, won't remove these, but these going around, all these are quarter inch, and we will end up just removing those with a quarter inch nut driver. And I always use a little magnetic tray to hold these on. Now, I'm sliding this around on my workbench here, and my, one of my last videos on the Macintosh gear, I had somebody comment about, wow, it just, just drives me crazy that you're sliding the edge of this. Um, unit around on this workbench top. Why wouldn't you put a towel down or something? So two reasons One this is a static um, real electronics workbench and this top here is Somewhat soft. Um, it's not a hard material. It's uh, maybe some type of softer formica that's designed to be static free um, So I don't have to worry about that too when I throw a white cloth behind something or, or something white it um, kind of throws the camera out of focus, so I've been trying not to do as much of that lately, but we're going to get the bottom off here. You guys ready for the great big unveil? I think this is the first time the bottoms have been off of these since 1958 when they were made at the uh, Scott factory. So I can tell you that these electrolytics are definitely original. That's an easy C right off the top. I see a lot of what we would call in the industry bumblebee capacitors here, which, you know, have a good sound, <laughs> and at the same time they fail you. Uh, these things are notorious for being uh, bad at this point in time. They basically dried out and breaking down, and they do not serve their purpose anymore. And so, um, you know, you can kind of see some, some tape here that kind of held the wires together here. You can see the resistors here. I imagine these will end up being cathode resistors for the uh, for the bias. These these are little covers here. These don't come off. Um, these are the bottom plates of the amplifier and mounted directly to it are the uh, transformers on the other side of this. So You can see they use black uh, shielded wiring here and boy this stuff is tacky 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 so I'm not sure what the, the coating was on those uh, those wires, but it's uh, almost a st sticky lacquer. Um, but just absolutely beautiful units. Nothing super, super complex here as I look at it, you know. Um, just looking at the capacitors here, um, you can't see it probably, but I can right here. We've got some black oozing out around this uh, post right here, so that capacitor is definitely breaking down. I can see some discoloration around these, telling me that they've been uh, leaking at least some gas or <laughs> potentially steam out of them as the uh, the insides heated up. That's what happens with these old resistors. It's a it's a it's a um, it's a, what would you call it? Somewhat of a self-destructing mode because what happens is these old capacitors. Um, as they start to break down, what they do is they start building up heat. So they're inside of them, they start building up heat, which causes them what? To break down even more. And then so the more you use them, it's kind of a, you know, a fast uh, degenerative process here where they kind of 
go astray on you. But, I, you know, I'm starting to count. It's like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, uh, up in the top here, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Um, somewhere here in the neighborhood of 21 capacitors, and I'm probably missing one or two here because I'm trying not to stick my head completely in the way, but somewhere around 21, 22 capacitors we've got to replace in this unit. And I'm going to have a conversation with the the individual that owns these about, you know, how much are they wanting to invest in these coupling caps because, you know, you could you could go as cheap as some Maori 150Ms and spend maybe $2 a capacitor, so you got $40-ish in capacitors here. You could go all the way up high end where you're spending, you know, $20 to $50 per capacitor, and next thing you know, this is a, a $2,000 restoration. So, um... We'll have, to, we'll have to see what the uh, the owner wants to do there. All right, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get to documenting. Okay, let's talk about the general approach I use to restore a unit like this. And this would hold true for this unit, any other Scott unit like this. Fisher 500, 500C, 800, you name it. Um, if it's a, if it's a unit looks something like this under the chassis, this is how I would go about it. Okay. First and foremost, there is no world that exists that I would not replace one, two, three, four, all four of these canalytrolytic capacitors. I don't care if they all test good today. I don't trust them to last the owner another 60 years, much less another six months, okay? So those are getting replaced. Second up, electrolytics like this, there is no world I'm not replacing these. And by the way, there's 100 microfarad at 75 volts here, 100 microfarad at 75 volts here. There's a 10 microfarad at 75 volts here. And hidden way up underneath right here is another um, 10 microfarad at 75 volts. So there's four of these just um, axials type electrolytics. Those are getting replaced, okay? Now, the bumblebees is where it gets into a huge debatable topic with a lot of people. There are people that say, if I take all these bumblebees out, much like with Macintosh gear, I will change the sound of this amplifier. And the, the response to that is, you're probably right. Um, I won't argue that point. I will also argue, though, that leaving them in here is a disaster. I don't know if you guys saw in the pictures I showed in video one, but one of the EL34s is just pretty much burnt up. You could, you know, there was no get her flash left on it, whatnot. And I, I would bet $100 right now to anybody that that's the result of one of these capacitors being leaky and letting too much current um, onto the grid of that tube and basically throwing it way out of bias, running it hot, and burning it up, okay? And so you could take the measures of going through here and testing each of these units and the ones that, and you have to test them not just for capacitance, but you've got to have something like a tell on mic or whatnot, um, capacitor tester, an old vintage capacitor tester that puts 600 volts or so on these capacitors and test them, okay? Um, this little unit right here, will not do that. So this will just tell you whether the capacitance is there or not. It will not tell you whether these units are leaky or not. So you could do that, and the ones that are not leaky you could leave in here. I still won't do it. Here's why. These units at some point will start leaking, and whether it's one year from now, two years from now, it's probably not another 50 or 60 years from now. They will start failing you, and at that point, you're going to cause problems in the amplifier, and this unit's going to be back in your shop if you're restoring this for someone. It's going to be back in your shop, and you're going to have to, you're going to have to be repairing it yet again, probably on your dime this time, because you didn't do all the things that should have been done to it the first time, okay? So I replace all of these, and yes, will it likely change the sound? Yes. But that's going to be true with any amplifier and any capacitors. These things do play a role in the overall, I'll call it, sound of the unit, okay? It's a very subjective topic, 
and um, doesn't necessarily um, always mean it's a bad thing because we're swapping these out. So I think we'll go with some decent quality caps. It'll keep you know, most of the tone intact, if not all, um, and it will at the end of the day will turn out to be an amazing sounding amplifier. Might you do an A-B test against one that's all vintage and they sound slightly different? Yes, but you could do that with any amplifiers. I could go grab a Scott um, 299 amplifier and put it beside this and play it, and it would sound slightly different, right? It's just the tonal, tonal attributes we're talking about here. So we're going to replace all these bumblebees. That is a definite given. Number three. I'm going to go through and test as many resistors as I can just using a plain old resistor checker. And we're going to have all the tubes pulled when I do that. And a lot of these go nowhere. In other words, they go from maybe right here to a pin on a tube. And then thus it's easy to test from one side to the other. And you can tell whether this is way out of spec or not. Others are going to be in parallel with each other or in parallel with something else in the circuit. And it's not as easy to test. And with those, typically what I like to do is I like to get both units up on the bench side by side if I've got a pair of them, and I'll test that on one. I'll test the same section on the other, and I can typically tell then, if, let's just say I tested this and I got 310 ohms, but that's not a 310 ohm resistor. It's because some other stuff are in parallel with it. Well, if I test the other unit over here, the exact same spot, and I get 310 ohms, I'm likely in a good in a good place and don't need to replace any of those. If I tested this one, got 310, tested the other one, got 2,400 ohms, something's out of whack and I need to dive in deeper. I might need to cut the, the ends of these and lift them up. But I'm going to try to leave in as many of these carbon comp resistors as I possibly can because they contribute to the tonal attributes of this amp, okay? Now, it is a known fact that over time, these carbon comp resistors like this start to drift up in value in time. So something that was a 330K ohm resistor back in the day might be a 348K resistor right now. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, okay? Because one, all things may be drifting relative to each other upwards, and two, you may still be able to bias this amplifier out just fine with the, you know, with some with some variance there. Keep in mind, if you look at the specs on all these resistors and capacitors when they were bought, look at this. 10% devices, right? 20% devices. Um, these things were never accurate from the day they were made at the factory. Um, and thus, you know, a little bit of, of driftage here or there. I, if something shows more than 20% out of spec, yeah, I'm probably going to replace it. But I'm going to try to leave as much of that intact as possible. I can tell you these little silver mica capacitors right here, Probably not even worth your time testing. They're probably rock solid, on spot on. Um, these things have very little drift over time, and they hold up extremely well. So I'm not saying I won't test them. I'm just saying um, probably don't have to. You know, I'm, back here I've got some um, some you know wire round uh, resistors here, um, kind of the, mounted in the uh, paper sand whatnot. These, you know, 33 ohm, 80 ohm, 75 ohm, they're probably fairly within spec. These are not known for drifting out of, of spec over time. And I've got a similar um, resistor right here that's probably um, within spec. But, you know, if you're inclined, feel free. Go ahead and test those. We'll certainly clean all these switches in here, re replace, like I said, the bumblebees. We will clean the tube sockets. We will test all the tubes. We'll replace the electrolytics on top. Um, then we will bring this unit up and see how it see how it does. So let's get started down that path. Here's the beauty of having a Sam's photo fact folder if you can find one. One, it points you and it already labels and numbers all your capacitors for you. So when you're building your parts list uh, or bomb, you can uh, you can easily label them this way. Okay. Number two, it gives you a nice little laid out. Look at this. It breaks out the electrolytic capacitors. It breaks out the fixed capacitors. It's really easy to tell which ones are the bumblebees because they're the ones right here with the 400 volt rating on them. And they all start with CPM here, right? Um, and so you can see the 0 0.022 here, the 0 0.0012, the 0 0.047, on down the list. So in other words, I don't necessarily have to go and read every one of these 
and then you know decipher the color codes on them. What I'm going to do though is I'm going to make my list and then I'm going to come back using this and I'm just going to kind of glance and say okay C1 here what was it in here and I'm just going to kind of do a verify okay it said it was this but I, I read the color values here and it was that so I'll do, I'll do a quick comparison at the end of the, the end of that and let's go ahead and get our get our building materials made all right, I'll show you how I'm doing this. I'm going through and I started at the top one here and it's 0 0.022 at 400 volts. And then I just went down the rest of the list and everywhere there's a 0 0.022, I put a little red tick mark. Then I come back and I add up all my little red tick marks here. And lo and behold, what do I need? I need 8.022 microfarad capacitors. And we'll just, we'll just come down the line next as a 0 0.0 zero one two and I'll just go down the line like right here's another one and I'll just do the same thing here okay we've got our list made now um, of either coupling or decoupling caps here um, as you can see here the list is uh, let's see 8, 9, 10, 15, 17, 20, 22, 23, 26, 27, 28 capacitors total now don't forget that's 28 you got to multiply all this times 2 so at the end of the day because we got two of these amps to do right we've really got 56 capacitors total we've got to order for these two amplifiers plus that's just coupling decoupling plus these over here all together um, 56 plus um, 2 times four here that would be eight so that would put us up to 64 65 6 6 7 68 72 total capacitors if you count all of this 72 total electrolytic and cup slash d cup it's a lot of capacitors <laughs> no matter how you go about it one more thing i want to show you before I go build the order. If you notice here, all these are 400 volts. You know, let's just say you're out searching for a capacitor and the one you're wanting, the 0 0.047 microfarad, you found it at 500 volts or 600 volts. As long as the size of it physically doesn't get too big, you can always go with a larger um, value um, voltage rating on a capacitor and be just fine. As a matter of fact, if I ordered all these at 600, I would be fine. Um, matter of fact, they might even run a little cooler. Um, but what you can't play with are these values. These are very specific and very purposeful in, uh, you know, in the tone controls and uh, filtering going on within this, when this, within this amplifier. Same holds true over here. You could go with larger voltages here. So let's say you found a can cap that had 10 microfarads at 500 volts and 10 microfarads at 500 volts and 20 microfarads at 50 volts and 20 microfarads at 50 volts. What are that thing? Um, it, you know, if that's what you, what you closest thing you can find to this. What would not work is 10 microfarad at 300 volts. Don't do it, okay? Make sure you stay, stay fairly consistent on this. Now, I'll give you an example here. Let's say instead of 30 microfarad, the capacitors you found were 33 microfarad. Since this is all part of the power supply, you're okay to go up a little bit in value. So instead of 40, if you went to 47 microfarad, you'll be perfectly fine. What you don't want to do is go lower in capacitance and you don't want to add a significant amount more. You wouldn't want to take 10 microfarad and place, replace that with 80 microfarad because um, of how it may play out in the circuit. Maybe that's the first cap after the 5U4 rectifier that has a limit of about 40 microfarads after the first stage. And so you were trying to do that. Stick with the capacitor values as close as possible. Um, on coupling caps, don't deviate at all. Electrolytics, you can go up slightly. Um, voltages to go above are okay as long as you stay within the physical constraints of the sizes where you've got to place these things. All right, last and not least before we place our parts order here, we've got to check out what's inside of this uh, little passive stereo control amplifier. So there again, we just got these uh, quarter inch screws. We're going to get all these removed. All right, we've got the cover off, and even though it's a passive unit, okay, so there's no active amplification going on anywhere inside of here, 
Um, we do have some capacitors going on in here. Um, I could not, they don't, I couldn't find a uh, photo, Sam's photo fact or anything for this little unit. Um, but it's simple enough. They're just some simple uh, silver mica caps here, which, as I mentioned before, are likely just fine. And then we've got three capacitors here. So we've got a pyramid. Um, this is a 0 0.02, excuse me, four capacitors, 0 0.022 at 400. We've got here a 0.01 at 400, another 0.01 at 400, and hiding down underneath here is another 0.022 at 400. So we've got four capacitors here that we should definitely go ahead and replace as well while we're at it. And uh, everything else here will just be a matter of cleaning switches and whatnot. And we only need one of each of these because we don't have two of these units. Okay, we've kind of got our ports ordered together now. Got all these times two, got these times two, got all these times two, got these times one because these are in the model 135. That brings us to a total needed for the complete restoration on both of these units of 76 capacitors. So um, getting ready to jump on the phone with the individual um, that owns these units and uh, we'll see what, which route he wants to go here. Uh, he, <laughs> I think he might have been thinking high end, but when he sees 76, um, maybe we land somewhere a little south of that. We'll see. All right, so there are some alternative approaches to replacing all 56 capacitors with uh, super high end equivalents. Um, one path you could take is what I'm showing here. I basically pulled the schematic up and I've gone through it um, kind of and I've highlighted all the coupling capacitors that are between stages so you can see here coming off of this first stage of this phono um, one side of a 12ax7 you feed through another one into the next one after you leave the phono stage you go through another coupling cap here and i've basically done that through the whole entire amplifier okay and what that does is it creates what i would call the signal path and i would call these the signal path capacitors now, now don't get me wrong a lot of these other capacitors play a role in the signal. They're just not critical path, direct line, um, coupling various stages together. In other words, they may be used in some roll-off frequency as part of some filter. Um, they may be used as part of the treble or bass controls. Um, they may be part of the noise filter, things of that nature. So yes, they could play a difference, but they're not you know, mainstream to the everyday um, ongoings of this amp constantly. Uh, those things would vary based upon people's settings. And so you could take an approach here where you kind of, maybe the rest of the amp, all these other capacitors that may be decoupling um, or part of some filtering circuit or a coupling capacitor, you could take all of those and potentially, you know, use something fairly standardized that were good quality. I'll give an example, maybe Mallory 150M capacitors, orange drops, uh, the Panasonic uh, kind of brown caps um, throughout the rest of the amp. And then you could elect to go high end on these signal path capacitors. And so I ended up calling yesterday the owner of these amps and we spent 30 minutes or so talking about a little bit of a lot of things and this being one of those and um, so I may you know I'll show you a couple options that we're going to pass you know from a build standpoint uh, parts list that we're, that we're going to go down here I will tell you that you have to be careful um, some of these capacitors and I'll just give an example here you've got some 0.047s right there's quite a few of those here there's one here here, here, here. Um, if you were to go and get some extremely high-end exotic capacitors and you fall in love with something here, let me let me give you an example. Okay, here's a good example. Let's say you went out and you're trying to pick out some super high-end capacitors you had read great reviews about in a uh, high-end stereo magazine, and you find these copper foil paper propylene oil caps here. And so you decide, this is what I want to go with. And let's say money is no object, so you're going to replace a bunch of caps. By the way, just for the for fun and giggles, 56, let's times 34. Well, it would only cost you $1,904 to replace all the capacitors in one amplifier. If 
you went this route. But herein lies the real problem, okay? If you read this, it's 1.74 inches in diameter by 1.97 inches. And they even say this, check the dimensions because these caps are not small. I'm sure they've ran into this. Somebody bought these to put into their unit, something similar to this, or maybe a, uh, a Fisher piece of gear, something that has a bottom plate to it and not a lot of room, but a whole lot of parts stuffed in there. And they bought them and got them and said, wow, these won't even fit inside of my amp or my unit or preamp. And so I need to return them. Um, so at any rate, you just kind of get, see see this picture here I've got? This is from this actual inside unit, um, actually underneath here, the 210F. Look at that. All those capacitors right there together, and that those two tag strips are about a little over an inch and a quarter apart. So how, how are you going to stuff these great big caps? And this is, this is kind of true of a lot of these, what I'll call small batch high-end capacitors here. So just be careful when you make sure you check the capacitor sizes when you're ordering. And that may be your limiting factor as much as anything else on what you're wanting to put into it. Hey, you can spend a lot of time at this point in the game. Let me give you an example here. I'm trying to match up the capacitor values I need. Now, I'd like to stay somewhat consistent. So what I've, what I've got in mind here is um, everywhere I've got signal capacitors, let's use a higher end capacitor. Anywhere I just have capacitor listed, let's try to use something a little um, more generic, something like these uh, 715P orange drops. Well, the problem you run into, if you'll notice here, um, we need some 0.0012, some 0.0018, some 0.0068. Those don't exist here. You don't you don't have the 0 0.0018, 0 0.0068. It's not an option. Um, and you kind of come back and you go to the Mallory 150 series, right? Um, similar story here. You really can't get all the values you need or at least off of uh, antique electronics supply here. Let's see what we can find elsewhere. Okay, so where we ended up at, and this is what I sent to the owner of these units. Um, this was a spreadsheet I made with using all Sonic caps. And uh, to get to get these smaller values, you have to shift over to some Gen 2 Sonic caps. And then for the signal capacitors, whatnot, I'm trying to use Gen 1 Sonic caps. Ended up at $279 total here, and you can, uh, if, you know, if you're so desired, you can follow the link here that will take you to uh, Sonic Craft's website, and it has all these capacitor values here that you would need to uh, fill this out. But you're, you know, you're at $279, and that's per amplifier in just the coupling caps on this unit. And people may ask, why am I replacing all the coupling caps but not replacing all these carbon comp resistors? It's a great conversation to be had. The coupling caps, the reason I'm replacing all of these is even though these older Bumblebee capacitors do give this unit some of its sound, they are just notorious for failure. And if I left these any of these in here, I would have great fear that this amp would be back in my shop at some point and we would have an unhappy customer. On the flip side, carbon comp resistors, okay? Those give the amplifier its tone, and yes, over time, historically, carbon comp resistors have drifted up in value, but it's not necessarily a failure point, okay? And so I'll go through and test these. Anything majorly not out of spec will leave in place. Try to maintain as much of the sonal the tonal attributes of this amplifier that existed in it when it was original, but I don't have to worry that one of these caps, I mean, one of these carbon comp resistors is going to fail me a year down the road or whatnot, and then it's going to be back in my shop. So that's kind of the logic behind all of this. So on the next tab of my spreadsheet here, what I have is basically the same um, pricing here as using the Sonicrafts as the signal capacitors, but then I've swapped out um, the Panasonic ECQF polyester metallized 400 volt, and some of them I had to use 630 volt um, capacitors here for the what I would call more generic capacitors, the non-direct signal path, the uh, filters, the um, roll-off capacitors, decoupling caps, things of that nature. And so you can see here it dropped the price significantly. So instead of like $4, $3, Per capacitor here, you're at 45 cent for per capacitor. 
and um, I made a link here to um, to the website on these from Panasonic that gives you all the specs and uh, details about these. I have also um, made a link here on this that will take you to Mauser's website that is sorted by these types of capacitors already for you and you can uh, go through and find what you need to buy here okay um, but as you can see it's $149 per amplifier if this was my amplifier personally this is probably the route I would take because I don't think these um, all these other capacitors I think these are going to in other words just saying these polyester metallized and this these spaces are going to perform a perfect job and um, you know, be a good blend of high quality caps for the signal path and still really good caps just not um, these are not quite exotic but you get my point higher end caps here for the signal path um, and then up next what I did was the same thing but in use in places where I could when you start to get into really high end capacitors exotic caps these things are what I would call short batch run capacitors they're they start to get expensive because there's not a lot of volume of them made and they don't come in a large variety of different sizes and shapes so i was trying to use the multi-cap rtx series here and out of all of these capacitors the only ones that they even made in in the uh in the correct value was the um 0.022s and 0.047s but you can see here even with that you're up into the 232 dollar price range and there's a link here for this and then finally a path i've not personally gone down before with, but was wanting to explore me and the owner of these started talking about hey what about going down a paper and oil path you know potentially old russian and russian paper and oils maybe old vitamin q's things of that nature and these things have just dried up um, to the point that you really can't find them in quantities of like 10. Yes, could I go on eBay and find a 0.047 vitamin Q? Yes, but there's not 10 of them on eBay at this point in time. Um, so at any rate, Mojo Tone here, and, I, and I've got a link here. I'll see if I can show you. Uh, Mojo Tone has had some batches of these, and they're calling them vitamin T, and I'm pretty sure they tried to copy the vitamin Qs as much as they could. There might be some magic to the types of oils that were used in the vitamin Qs, they might have also contained, contained PCBs, I'm not sure. <laughs> but a lot of those older oil field capacitors did have carcinogenic type uh, content in them, thus why they're not made anymore. But at any rate, you see you can get a good selection here of Mojo Tone field um, vitamin caps. So I thought, you know, it's a, it's a path we could explore, and the price on them is, uh, is uh, re reasonably different, 164 dollars here so at any rate i've got the uh, this sent off to the owner and he and i've been chatting a little bit um, on facebook messenger about it we'll see where we land when we come back um, after um, after i get the parts ordered and show up we'll see where which path he decides to go with but i uh, just want to show you a little bit of the logic i used here in selecting capacitors okay and last here what i needed for the can caps in this unit um, I, did, I took two routes. One, I went to Antique Electronic Supply and sorted through all their existing capacitors here to see if I could find something that would match and not have to uh, have something custom made. Turns out I could not find anything to do that with. So I ended up over here on Hayseed Hamfest website. And, and they've actually got, if you go to Audio HH Scott here, they've got some pre-made units, but as we know, these two 10Fs are pretty rare. so. They don't have it listed but i checked out all the ones they had just to make sure that the 210f wasn't the same as maybe a an lk 72b or whatnot turns out it was not the case so what i need to do then is i need to come over here and basically request a, a quote okay the good news is we need four can capacitors but we really only need to enter in two quotes because we have um we need two of the same type. Um, there's only two different types here. So we'll put in our name here. We'll put in our email address. Make and model, we'll put in H8 Scott 210F. Um, desired height here. We need to pay special attention on this one because if you'll remember, two and a half inches would not work. We have to tell it two inches. Then we have to tell it our capacitor sections. 
and we're going to enter in 30 UF at 475 volts. Same here, 20 UF at 475 volts. And that's all we have. There's no section 3 and section 4 in this one. I've already submitted the quote for the other one. Can insulation. Is the outside of the can insulated with cardboard? No. Okay. Do I need any mounting wafers? In other words, when I take the old ones out, am I going to break any? I've got spare ones, so I'm going to say no. This is a common negative cap. If you'll remember, it It told that on the can cap. It said it should be printed on your original can. Anything else you need to know? You probably want to tell them you need two of these. Okay. And then you submit that. And basically, you get back, thanks for your submission. They'll send me a, a custom quote. My guess is these are going to be about $30 to $40 a piece times four. So you're somewhere in the $120 to $160 range. I'm, I'm betting we come out about $135, $140 would be my guess. We'll see what we'll see what happens here. Okay, we're going to talk with the customer a little more, get these parts on order, and um, be back to you when we get them in the house and I'll start doing the actual restoration on this unit. Having a lot of fun here. Hope you are too. Thanks for watching, everyone.